We are here because we know the outcomes in our lives are within our control. That taking absolute ownership of how we eat, sleep, train, think, and connect with each other is how we'll optimize our health and happiness. That chasing excellence is how we grab hold of what is possible. Our mission is to live on the run. Always chasing. Never stop. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Chasing Excellence, a special episode. Ben, we are joined today by Dr. Nate Zinser. Uh, Dr. Nate, or Doc Z, as you told us to call you, uh, is the director of the performance psychology program at West Point. You've worked with elite athletes at the pro, collegiate, and Olympic levels, and more specifically, to the reason you are here, you are the author of the new book, The Confident Mind, a battle-tested guide to unshakable performance. Thank you so much for taking some time to talk to us today. Uh, gents, it's a great to be here. Let's rock. Uh, before we kick off, let's, let's, I just want to, I want to make I was the, gonna the say, I was going to do that, the same thing. Um, go for it. Yeah. Dr. Z was uh, um, a coach for Chandler while he was at um, at West Point at Army. Ar Chandler was the captain of the Army wrestling team and um, – Basically, he attributes every bit of the success that Chandler's ever had to the time he spent in Doctor Z's office. Chandler so, is very. Terrible. I am. I. <laughs> geez, uh, so I'm so excited to um, read the book, and um, it is. I was just saying before we start recording that you know I've I've read you know I try to read as much as I can about this topic, and this book um, beautiful in its simplicity and powerful in its um, uh, delivery. So. Very, very well done on a um, um, on a really well written book that's easy to easy to grasp and um, put into practice. So Agreed. kudos. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, Doxy, I wanted to, I wanted to start with just a big broad question to get us into this conversation to get us into some of the some of the topics inside the book. I would love it if you could explain to us tell uh, and tell us what you mean when you say the first victory. What does that mean? What why does that have something to do with uh, building a more confident mind? Well, confidence really is the first victory that you have to win before you step into a sports competition, an academic test, a, a recital, any moment where you are in the spotlight. If, if you want to do your best, whatever your best might be, you have to come up with a sense of certainty about yourself. Otherwise, you are going to be taking the test, playing the game playing the recital, in a state of questioning, what's next, how am I doing, oh, what might happen? And that process of being doubtful, uncertain, etc., etc., will always cause physical hesitation in your fingers, in your feet, in every part of your body. So as the Chinese military strategist Sun Tzu put it, victorious warriors win first and then go into battle. They decide, this is my moment, this is my time, I'm going to do this, let's see how great I can be. And then they go into battle, while the losers go into battle and hope to win. Gee, I hope I do okay. Uh, gee, I wonder how tough it'll be. You have to win that first victory before you can win the actual victory, the score on the test, the score on the field the applause from the recital that's so i think most people listening to this podcast have probably heard something like that but you bring some color to that conversation that uh i love which is um i really like that how the 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 thoughts turn into emotions emotions lead into you call it either the success or the sewer cycle and that's right there the this it it, it shows the mind body connection and how that can is, as you just said, one is going to lead to an average or below performance and one will lead to a good performance. Can you um, expand upon a little bit about the, the, what you mean by those success and sewer cycles? Sure thing. Um, here in the scientific, rational Western world, we have generally grown up with the idea that our mental activity – our thoughts, the things we say to ourselves, the things we think about, the things we remember, the things we anticipate or fantasize, those are just abstract phenomena while our physical bodies, our musculature, our cardiovascular system, all of that is 
distinct from those abstract thoughts. The reality is that those thoughts are electrochemical signals in our brain, and those electrochemical signals stimulate other parts of the brain, and that parts of the brain stimulates various changes throughout our body. So everything that we think, in a way, affects the muscle tension, blood flow, hormone production, a host of physiological systems. And because we are all physical human beings living in a body, everything that we do, we do through our body. If we want to optimize our performance, be it you know running a race, competing in a boxing match, giving a piano recital, taking a physics test, we've got to make sure that our body's in the right state and our body is going to be a reflection of the, the mood or the emotions that we're feeling. And those moods and emotions are a result of the entire complex of thoughts that we have been entertaining and maintaining about ourselves. So depending on how you think, you're either going to optimize the state of your body or you're going to degrade the state of your body. I refer to the cycle through which you think constructively, develop a confident mood, optimize the state of the body, and then give your chance to ex execute well and then reflect upon that. I refer to that as the su success cycle, the cycle in which you worry, doubt, fear, creating a mood of uncertainty that creates other physical changes, tightness, restricted blood flow, the production of stress chemicals, cortisol, etc. That physical state puts you in a likely condition to perform more poorly, and then you think about that poor performance, and you're in a cycle that way. I refer to that as the sewer cycle. We all know what goes down the sewer. <laughs> yeah, so I love it. It's just, um, I lo what I love about the way that you, de you describe this is, um, you give actual like words to it, like the way that actually somebody might actually think, which I love is in the sewer cycle, that unconscious, that conscious thought is something like, oh, this is going to suck or, oh, crap, or I'm in trouble now or, oh, I don't, let's not screw this up. Mm -hmm. That conscious thought leads to unconscious emotions of frustration, worry, stress, which leads to the physical state of, as you said, high tension, constricted blood flow, which of course is going to lead to a decreased performance. And then the opposite is true for the, for the, um, those that think like, which I, I love the words that you use, which is this kind of like, um, energetic curiosity. Mm -hmm. And uh, that to me is uh, one of the biggest takeaways that you just like pull that out right away, which is instead of this, woe is me victim mindset of this is going to suck. It's this curious approach of, well, I wonder how well I, how, I wonder how the words you use a lot is like, I wonder how great I can be at this. Yeah, and that, that statement is very important. I wonder how well I can do with this. I wonder how good I can be today. That implies, if you look at that statement word by word by word, that there is some quality, there is some greatness that you are capable of, and you are just in a process of determining how much of that you're going to experience. Um, I will say that there are neurologically some feedback loops from the body back to the emotional state, from the emotional state back to the cognitive state. But the basic direction that we can really think about and utilize to help ourselves, you know, succeed in a CrossFit competition is to go in there with a, a whole pile of conscious thoughts that are in the energetic curiosity form. Let's see how well I can do today. Let's see if I can PR on this. Let's see if I can beat so-and-so. Won't that be great? And those thoughts help create a mood of excitement and eagerness. That mood will fire up the body. That mood will energize the cells. Eh, give you the best chance of doing well. So maybe... May, um because it's called the confident mind. Maybe we back up a little bit. What it, how do you define confidence? Mm. The million dollar question, okay? Huh. <laughs> um, I define confidence as a sense of certainty about yourself, respective to a certain ability or set of abilities that allows you to do what you know how to do without thinking a whole lot about it, more or less unconsciously. You're all extremely confident when it comes to things like tying your shoes, 
and driving your car down a familiar street. Those are both very complicated activities, but you've internalized, your nervous system has internalized them to the point where you can indeed do them very well. The idea is to develop that same sense of certainty to internalize your level of skill to the point where you decide not to question it anymore and you can let it express itself, whether you're in your own gym doing your own workout or whether you are performing at a world CrossFit competition with a whole bunch of judges and timekeepers who are ranking everything. It's the same skill. You simply allow that skill, that set of skills to come out without judgment, analysis, self-criticism. That's what confidence is. And I would point out that the confidence I'm talking about is entirely internal. It's got nothing to do with how much you open your mouth and how much you say about yourself. And that is very important to understand because most people think of a confident individual as somebody who is rather loud, rather boastful, calling attention to him or herself. Well, that's not confidence. That's just boasting. If you want to boast, go ahead, boast. That doesn't mean you're confident. And just because you're not boasting, that certainly doesn't mean you're not confident either. There are some people who love to boast and they're confident. There's some people who, it's just not their natural style to boast, but boy, do they have it on the inside. Boy, do they have that sense of certainty on the inside. They're really confident folks. I'd be more worried about them as a competitor. So it's this, um, I really, I, and I really do love that, <clears throat> that approach and that definition to confidence. And it, it seems like it's this mental chatter, this, the analytical mind that's kind of pulling us away from that. And I, 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 the examples of <clears throat> driving your car, um, tying your shoes, or as you said in the book, it's like trying to go down a flight of stairs real fast. If you give somebody like, let's think about that. Think about how your, what your knees are doing as you try to go down a flight of stairs as fast as you can. Like the chances that they end up on a pile at the bottom is pretty, pretty good because it, it, you need to let go of that. What, how does somebody do that though? Like what, what mechanistically as a coach, what would you suggest someone, what are the steps that someone takes to, besides the obvious of just becoming more skilled and competent at said task, what is the, what would be some other steps that somebody could do to allow themselves to let go of that chatter or analytical thought? Um, I would go back to a movement or a technique that you find yourself able to do entirely naturally do a whole lot of that and then gradually work yourself up to more difficult, more complicated, more demanding tasks while maintaining that same kind of innocent, well, this is a no brainer type of attitude. You can absolutely build it and you can work through various degrees of skill, various degrees of physical challenge that way. And you can also basically build your confidence by reflecting properly on progress, on small successes. And if you accumulate enough of those thoughts, enough of those memories, you can say, okay, well, I guess I understand how to do this stuff. I guess I don't have to think about it anymore. Let's just go have fun and let it rock. And I find a lot of my work is getting people to believe that that's an okay thing to do. Getting people to understand that the more I do, let it go, release that tendency to analyze everything, the happier I'm going to be, the better I'm going to play. We have grown up in a world where, gosh, you're supposed to think carefully about what you're doing. You're supposed to be serious. You're supposed to address your weaknesses and really have this attitude of deliberately making change happen. And there's a time and a place for that attitude. It's not right before a competition, and it certainly isn't during a competition. I, I appreciate that because I, I think, as you said, we, we do, even as a coach in the CrossFit space, in our, our sport's a little bit different than other sports where you really can't hide your weaknesses. If you're a wrestler mm -hmm. and you aren't good at something, you, you just do everything you can to avoid it. In our sport right. – you don't have that luxury if you're, you know, if you're a football player and you don't have a running game, you know, running, you don't have a running game. You just 
pass the ball a lot. Hopefully. Right. Yeah. Right. If you, hopefully, <laughs> um, our sports are a little bit different where they, you're purposely, your weaknesses are being exposed all the time because you might be strong, but now you have to do, you know, a 10 K run. You might be, um, quick, but now you have to be, you know, it's just all, you, you can't swim. So, but I like, you know, I like that approach though, because as a coach, I'm going to walk away from this with that, you know, cause I think I have a tendency to harp on what the things are that we constantly need to work on. And I can see how that eats away at the athletes. You know, it's, we need to have fun along the way. Well, harp, harp on that coach early in the season. If you're in a weekly rotation of training and competition, harp on it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, but Thursday you start backing off. Friday it's nothing but praise. Saturday it's nothing but praise. So that Sunday competition day, you know, the athlete is absolutely full of him or herself and has done the work and can say to them, see, I did the work early in the week. Now I'm just reinforcing it. Now I'm just reinforcing it. Now I feel really great about my chances for today, right now. And somebody does feel really great, and, but they get in there and then all of a sudden, you know, it's the inevitability of sport and life that there's going to be mistakes. There's going to be errors. There's going to be stumbles and falls. Um, how do you work with athletes that, um, that are going through slumps that are, um, maybe they feel like they're in over their head that they um, they haven't been able to level up to the next level. Okay, are we talking about a, an extended slump over two or three competitions, or are we just talking about a hiccup within a competition? Well, it's, I'm kind of leading the question because I really want you to talk about like the Tony Gwynn <laughs> thing about like just like kind of like a and I really love the the fish analogy in the pond. So yeah, I want I want both. <laughs> <laughs> well. Let's talk about the the one time situation. Here we are in a competition. We've trained well. We felt pretty good going in. We hit a hiccup. We have a mistake. <laughs> we have a setback relatively early in the competition. The confident athlete's response to that is, "Okay, yeah, I had a hiccup, but it was just that one. Yeah, I had a hiccup. It just happened in that particular event." or in that particular moment of that particular event, and it doesn't necessarily carry forward into the future, and it doesn't necessarily carry uh, outside of the particular place where it happened. I'm going to keep that mistake right there. I'm not going to bring it along with me. And very importantly, I'm going to admit that it happened, but I'm going to refuse to think of it as something that is defining me for that day. So the hiccup, the mistake, the setback is temporary. It's very limited in terms of where it occurred, and it's not representative. It doesn't tell the truth about me. And that is a habit that people have to practice in practice so that when the hiccups do happen in competition, in the recital, taking the exam, they've already learned how to stay in the moment, stay with themselves, still think pretty darn confidently even in the presence of inevitable human imperfection. That's a habit, okay? <laughs> now, if we're talking about a slump that has occurred, okay, I was at this level, and now I'm down at a, you know, I'm 10, 15% below that, week after week after week after week, that's where you gotta perhaps look at your training volume, your training intensity, and make sure that you're not you know, physically burned out, but you've also got to make sure that you are doing the right things mentally and you're still maintaining your good thinking habits, reflecting constructively on each workout, looking forward to each competition, having the right images, the right visions, the right uh, anticipation of what you're going to be facing. Um, really, a slump is, you know, a extended decrease in performance over time, you don't necessarily work your way out of the slump. You just have to make sure that you're not overreacting to it mentally and emotionally and that you're allowing yourself the space to breathe a little bit and say, okay, I can get back in there. I don't want to be preoccupied with the fact that, gosh, you know, I haven't scored well in my last one, two, three games. I'm 
going to treat those long ter longer term mistakes again as temporary, as limited, and as again not representative of who I am. I got to maintain the right kind of mindset rather than just physically punishing myself with more and more workouts, thinking the reason that I'm not performing well is because I haven't trained enough. Very few times have I experienced athletes saying, yeah, I performed poorly because I was undertrained. Athletes are going to tell me I performed poorly because I kind of got freaked out, you know, when, you know, the first 10 minutes of the game didn't go my way. I started questioning myself. I started questioning our schemes. I started questioning our coaches. And I just continued the rest of the game in a state of, you know, sort of frustration and resentment and worry. Okay. Well, I guess you were trained properly. I guess you didn't trust your training and use your training well enough. That's my quick answer. Can, um, I'm going to ask for a little bit of a longer answer. Can, do, do you remember the story you tell in the book about the – because I've never heard this before. Everyone knows the analogy of you know, the, the big fish in a small pond and then – yeah. You know, he go, he goes uh, so high school player stud you know captain all Amer all state whatever it is gets to the next level and all of a sudden whoa can't compete here your the way you work through that is so cool can you can you share that story sure happy to do that um, like you say you got a high school stud stud at he or she goes into a college program and now they're surrounded by lots of other competitors, opponents, teammates who have experienced a you know, pretty similar degree of success in their own respective high school ponds. Um, but what's funny is that that high school kid was pretty darn confident, felt pretty good about him or herself, was a pretty big healthy fish in that particular pond. Okay? Now, look, the uh, Fish and Wildlife uh, Service of your state picked you out of that pond and transported you to a, a larger pond, okay? Now it's the state pond. It's the national pond. It's the, it's the Olympic Development Camp pond. Um, it's the NFL. It's the NHL. It's a bigger pond, you know? So I always ask people, what happens to a perfectly healthy fish when it's put in a bigger pond which gives them more room to swim around, a lot more things to eat, and a lot more other big fish that are kind of like it that they can work with and learn from. And the answer always is, well, I guess that fish gets bigger. And um, that's the message I got to give to that high school kid. Look, you're a perfectly healthy fish. You didn't, you know, they didn't cut you. They didn't lessen you. They didn't diminish you, moving you from your smaller pond to your present big pond. They just put you in a place where you could grow better. So you have every reason to think that you are just as good as you ever were. And you can be eager about getting better and better and better and better because now you got better coaching. Now you got a better weight room. Now you got more good competitors through which you can develop your skills faster and faster and faster as opposed to being back in the high school pond where nobody was really pushing you because you were mm more talented, harder working than probably 80%, 90% of the other kids on your team. Good for you, big fish. Keep being that same big, healthy fish. And let's see how big and healthy you can become. Love it so much. Yeah. You also alluded to it in your answer to the previous question about the, uh, the inevitability of human imperfection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you, so that's, that's a big thing going on right now with, because you know, the, what's happening in the world and this perfectionism. Um, we could probably do a whole podcast just on this. Oh, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, can you, can you it, bring some color to that? It's funny. Well, you know, you can look at a again, look at a fellow like Chandler Smith, who is, you know, talented kid, hardworking kid. He just got engaged the, last weekend, by the way. Oh, he met, yeah. oh, he put the yes, ring on that did. woman. I met that She's woman. Awesome. At the, Jessica, <laughs> she trains here as well. Yeah. yeah. I, and I, a yeah, very, I one look very at her. fit person. Her, they're going to, their babies are going to be beautiful. No, I know. And they're, just... they're, they're, they're helping further the human race. They're actually, we're, <laughs> we're jumping forward like two generations when they have kids. 
Indeed, indeed. <laughs> yes, uh, she is a most impressive physical specimen, as as Chandler is. You know, but you know, Chandler comes out of a you know successful family. He comes to a prestigious institution. He's telling himself, "Yeah, this is this is a big time now. I've, I I really want to get it right." And what you got to work, be careful about is is making the transition from "I really want to get great. I really want to succeed. I really want to, you know, be a national champion or an all American." And I've got to succeed. I've got to be an all American. I've got to be that national champion, or I'm going to let myself down. I'm going to let my mom and dad down. I'm going to let my teammates down. And so, so many athletes put this extra unneeded pressure on themselves by thinking that I have to be perfect. I've got to get everything right. And every little mistake that I make is just pulling me back from my goals, pulling me back from my ultimate desires. And I got to keep telling people, look... Go ahead and strive for perfection. That's fine. But when you don't achieve it, which, let's face it, is going to be most of the time, when you don't achieve it, don't beat yourself up as a failure. Don't beat yourself up because you weren't perfect. Look at how far you've come. Look at how well you did. Give yourself credit for that. If you can tell by debriefing your own performance that you missed out on a certain skill or there's a certain um, physical attribute that you didn't quite bring out, okay, that is your recipe, that is your to-do list for the next few days, next few weeks maybe. But you pursue those things with the attitude of, hey, this is going to make me better. This is going to make me better. I'm excited about building these areas rather than I really mess this up. I got to fix this. There's something kind of wrong with me. So we want to strive for perfection, but we don't want to beat ourselves up. We don't want to fill ourselves with negativity when we don't achieve it. Um, a little bit of perfectionism is great. Too much of it is like too much pepper in the soup. It's You need a little to make it spicy, but if you put too much in, ah, it's awful. Human beings are like that as well. Um, Doc, one of the things that I really liked about this book was that it presented confidence as a skill, where I think a lot of times it's, thought of as the, 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 the reaction to, I think, you know, competence, the reaction to talent, the reaction to whatever it is. In other words, something happens and then I get confident. One of the things I love about this book is that it says, no, actually start with the building of confidence and then let that be kind of a flywheel that pushes forward. And one of the things you have early on in the book, you, you, you talk about, three different exercises that you recommend folks you're working with tackle, um, the top 10, uh, ESP and then IPR. Uh, can you maybe just quickly walk us through what each one of the, those exercises are, what they're for, and then how we can start to implement them in our own lives? Sure. Um, those are three exercises that help anyone make the maximum use, the maximum constructive effect of their memory. The top 10 is an exercise where you look back at your professional life, your work life, your sporting life, whatever area of your life you're curious about improving in, and hey, how about a list of your top 10 moments in that sport? You know, go ahead and mine, if you will, your memories and see if you can pull out a few of those little gold nuggets here and there. You know, that's those are your long term memories that build a sense of optimism and enthusiasm for yourself. And then day by day, at the end of every day, well, you got to do another reflective exercise. But you're, instead of reflecting back on the whole, whole of your career, you're reflecting back on what you did that day, pulling out an episode of good effort, pulling out an episode or two of success, pulling out an indication of progress just from today. 
Where did I put in quality effort? What did I get right? What do I seem to be getting better at? A daily ESP. So those are the smaller memories that produce a little bit of energy and optimism for yourself. And you add them on top of the big ones that you came up with through your top 10 exercise. And then if you really want to get specific mm -hmm. about it, you maintain that same sense of looking back on what you just did periodically throughout the day. You can look at, mm -hmm. you could look at that drill by drill in a practice session, station by station in the weight room. I finish, I finish one station. What was my best rep? I finish another state station. What was my best rep there? I finish a third thing. So I'm constantly in the process of bringing into my awareness the little things that make me feel better about myself. I do it in the long term with the top 10. I do it in the short term with the daily ESP. And I do it within the immediate term with that IPR. Mm -hmm. You know, the basketball player is going to do a shooting drill and then the coach blows the whistle and now we're going to do defensive footwork but between the end of the shooting drill and before the footwork drill that ball player has the option of either reflecting on the bricks that he put up or the beautiful ones that he put where he caught nothing but net you know and it's important that you choose to look at those constructive memories because that's what you want more of and if you think about what you're what you want more of hmm, you're a hell of a lot more likely to get it than if you are reflecting on where you messed up and the corrections you got to make. I, so I those, are three way, those are three ways yeah. of dealing with your memory. I can hear some of the, the athletes um, going like, no, wait a minute. I'm, I'm supposed to focus on the, the learning moments, the moments that um, like when coach blows the whistle, I should remember the things he told me that I need to work on. Why is it that we want to remember the highlights and not the the learnable, teachable moments? Well, see, the learnable, teachable moments, you can hang on to them too. It's a question of how you hang on to them. You know, the coach says, okay, son, mm. right. I need more of this. And you can say, okay, coach. And you can walk away thinking, oh, man, coach just chewed me out. Coach doesn't like it the way I do this. Or you can walk away from that same conversation and you can say, oh, coach just pointed out something that I can make a change in. I think I can make that change. When I do make that change, whoa, I'm going to be better. So it's a way of actually gaining confidence in yourself despite making mistakes while you are making mistakes. And I think that's what confident people really do. They look at some of their shortcomings and they say, hmm, okay, if I improve, if I improve my performance in that area, I'm going to get better. I've got a motion sensitive light here. Come on. There we go. <laughs> Magic. Um, I was wondering what, I was wondering what you said. Yeah. Well, no, I got a, I got a motion sensitive light in this office. Um, uh, Got it. Yeah, did, did that answer your question in terms yeah, of it's, it's a, how you yeah, so how you need to look at your shortcomings? I love. It's a matter of um, just framing. It's that it's the old saying. That's so, not what happens to you. It's ha what you think about what happens to you. How you interpret the statement. How you interpret a certain fact. You can look at it as a testament of a statement of that you know, basically puts you in a lower position relative to somebody else, or you can take it as information that fills you with a little bit more energy. Yeah, I can do that. I can learn that. I can get that. You know, I would imagine that the coach is not going to give you feedback on, on technique or feedback on your physical state if he didn't think that you could make the change, Okay that you could put in the reps you needed, or you could make that little change in the way you handle the ball, the way you handle an opponent. You know, yeah, I believe in you, kid. Do this. I need you to do this, kid. And the kid's got to walk away saying, okay, coach thinks I can do this. I'm going to find a way to do that. That's going to make me better. 
You make a point uh, in the book it's, uh, between uh, constructive thoughts and positive thoughts. Can you just maybe pick those apart yeah. for folks who who are who are what they're hearing is? Oh, I guess I just have to be really nice to myself and be really positive and et cetera. What is the difference mm -hmm. in your mind between a positive positive thinking and constructive thinking? Well, a, a constructive thought is something that gives you a reason to believe in yourself. Okay, a constructive thought is yes, I got better at that. Yes, this is making a difference. Yes, I just succeeded. Um, I I just sunk eight out of ten of my, uh, you know, fadeaway jumpers, or I just hit eight out of 10 of the, you know, upper corner of the lacrosse goal that I was shooting at. You know, a constructive thought is something that builds you. Mm -hmm. A positive thought, while positive thoughts can be constructive, there's some other positive thoughts. Yeah, is it, won't it be nice if uh, we have sunshine every day? Uh, won't yeah. it be nice if we win every game this season? You know, mm -hmm. um, I don't use the word positive thinking because it tends to bring up, you know, images of sunshine, lollipops and rainbows. Um, and you guys and I certainly don't live in a world of sunshine, lollipops and rainbows. We live in a world of sweat and blisters and fatigue. OK. And lactic acid buildup. OK. That's not sunshine. OK, we have to be constructive in how we think about ourselves, maybe not just thinking that everything is lovely. OK, maybe everything isn't lovely, but at least we're making progress here. We're making progress there. And so that's the distinction I make between just, you know, positive, happy unicorns flying around on a sunny day and constructive. OK, I'm getting this workout done. I just PR'd on that station. I am now going to push myself in this interval. Those are constructive thoughts. Are constructive thoughts, confidence, and mental toughness synonyms? I don't know if they're sy synonyms, but they sure as heck are related, okay? Confidence is a function of all your constructive thoughts. The more of those that you have, the more certain you're likely to be. Mental toughness refers to your refusal to let circumstance, situation, setbacks change the way you derive your confident, confident constructive thoughts and build that certainty. You know, mental toughness is not intestinal fortitude, God knows that's important, but mental toughness is the refusal to let your mind be dictated by circumstance, okay? You want to play a good game. You want to be in control of yourself. You want to handle the ball well, okay? And now some guy is talking trash at you. He's elbowing you in the paint. He's giving you a hard time. He's trying to get you away from your game. Your mind has to be tough enough not to let that noise, those distract, those potential distractions, change you from thinking about target, release, hustle. You want to keep your mind tough. Your mind doesn't change. That's how I think about mental toughness. And that mental toughness is essential so that you're constantly feeding your mind constructively so that you can feel that certainty, which is ultimately your confidence. Does that... that I, did I sequence that right for you, fellas? <laughs> Beautifully. Yeah, I, I, I'm a, I, I love that approach to mental toughness as well, where it's, it's um, you know, this ability to, to focus, to not get rattled, to not get after your game, not get your mind distracted, regardless of what's going on around you. That's, um, I think it's a really way, great way to say that. And I like how constructive thoughts lead to um, confidence. Can, uh, can we go back to, cause I think that what you do really well is, and we talked about it already a little bit, but this, the mind is this, it was thought of as this abstract phenomenon and the body is this physiological. Can we just like lay out the, the, and you, you alluded to a little bit. Can we take a little bit of a deeper dive into how, um, you know, your mind actually does manifest, um, physically in your body? Sure. Um, you can experience that um, anytime you like. Go ahead and 
go ahead and think about the the teacher in your high school who was always roaming the halls looking for people doing things a little bit wrong. That teacher, that administrator who was always scouting around. And do you remember how uncomfortable you felt around that person? I never did anything wrong, so I, I don't. You never did anything wrong. Yeah, okay. just the opposite. You know? Yeah, I was. It did. It wasn't how, one teacher. It was how, every teacher for me. It was every teacher. Every, okay, but okay. Now, so teachers made me uncomfortable. Yeah. So, so if if you see that person's face in your imagination, and you hear that person's voice, and you have that sense of, uh oh, here they come. Tell me that your heart isn't speeding up a little bit. Mm -hmm. Tell me that you don't feel a little bit of a twitch here and there. Okay. Now go to the other extreme. Think about the last time you were in a really comfortable hot tub or hot bath and you were lying back and the warmth was seeping in. And for just a few minutes, you didn't have to go anywhere. You didn't have to do anything. Did your face just relax a little bit? Can you sense any of those relatively minor physical changes? I mean, that's the mind-body connection. If you can imagine or recall the temperature in that hot tub, maybe you can even hear the bubbles if the bubbles were, were running, if the jets were running. You know? Maybe you can even remember the room it was in or the setting it was in. You can feel a little relaxation right, right then and there. All kinds of these simple memories trigger, produce physical reactions, okay? The whole, so much of the stress management industry is about encouraging people to take a moment, sit comfortably, create a mental picture of a safe and comfortable place that they've been in, or repeat a word such as peace or easy or joy to themselves over and over again and put a heart rate monitor on them, we see things drop. It's, it's that direct and that simple, but we tend to overlook that in our hurry up, go, go, go physical culture. I mean, that we are just beginning right now to understand the particular neurological pathways through which a repeated thought such as joy or easy or peace communicates and activates the vagus nerve, which acts on the heart, which slows down the heart rate, basically slows down the beats of your heart while you are exhaling and contributes to that feeling of ease. You know, yogis and philosophers have known this stuff for, for centuries. Scientists in the West just began to explore it, you know, in the late 1960s and early 1970s. And we really have only in the last couple of decades developed sensitive enough equipment that we can see, all right, when we activate a certain part of the brain, there's a corresponding change in a muscle or an organ system, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It's a fascinating area of science. I encourage a lot of your listeners to go into it. Yeah, I, mm. uh, I'm, I'm fascinated by it as well. And I, I didn't realize that the science was as new as it is um, until I, I, I read Confident Mind. And it's um, just recent, two nights ago, my son, I have a nine-year-old son. He was having a nightmare. And came, um, came into our, our bedroom, and he was a puddle of sweat, and he was shaking, and he was breathing like he had just, you know, done the hardest workout he's ever done. Run a run a marathon, yeah. yeah. So he's, <laughs> yeah. this, 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 he was in. He couldn't remember what the dream was, but he kept on saying like, I don't want to do. It was crazy. He was saying, I don't want to go into the battle. I don't want to go into the battle. Um, but that's what's that's like. It's so wild that the science is, you know, less than, you know, 50 years old in the West when how obvious is it that he was lying down, lying down completely still 
and thoughts in his mind caused a physiological response that made his heart rate jump up to the point where he couldn't catch his breath, sweat profusely. It, it, it's like the mind body connection is so powerful. And that's why I think it's so important that people dive into this. Cause as you've said, how many elite athletes, how many weekend warriors count every gram of carbohydrates, protein, and fat that they eat, know exactly what they're doing for their training regimens and schedules. But when it comes to the mind, they go, ah, and just like this, it's a, it's, yeah. it's a, it's a, a nothing. It's not even, they don't even equate it to performance at all. And this understanding right. of how powerful this is, and you can just do these, you've, you've already alluded to it, like these simple, like whether you're going to do a recital or present to a boardroom or be on an athletic field, or it's such a massive player in the field of performance. And I, I hope that more people dive into this, this, this world because it's so powerful. Yeah, I, I think the last, the last decade has seen a beginning of a change in respecting the power of the mind and human performance, you know. You know, you go back a decade, there were not too many Major League Baseball teams that had a mental skills coach. Well, you're, you'd be hard-pressed to find a Major League Baseball team that doesn't have one these days. You know, you look at big time college athletic departments, they've all got sports psychology experts working in there. There is at last a respect for the power of the mind, whether we're talking about, you know, a mental health situation where you want to make people feel comfortable about their lives and take it further. Once you've got people who are pretty comfortable, pretty healthy, pretty happy, now let's really explore the mind. Let's really get it working so that we can find out just how good we really are. We've gotten, we've made some changes in that in the last decade, and I hope we keep, hope we keep going in that direction. Where do, where does a, a practice like um, meditation, mindfulness, um, stillness, um, or the other extreme, I guess, is that is like mental performance games, where like a heart math or puzzles or solving problems mm -hmm. while training. Where does that fit into your 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 practice? Well, I use um, the M Wave program by the Heart Math Company as just a way of helping people understand what it feels like to give their body a very significant rest episode in a short period of time, okay? Um, I've been working at West Point for 30 years. You, know, you want to talk about a pressure cooker, all right? Uh, we got a pressure cooker. These people are up early. They're going hard all day. You better get your goddamn homework done. Uh, it's hard to fake it. Uh, you, you know, you are either in class or you are in the medical clinic or you're in deep trouble, you know? So going, mobilizing energy all out, all day, that is pretty hard. So what I, what we work he with here is encouraging our cadets to take a 10 minute, 12 minute, 15 minute, very significant rest episode, a recovery interval, maybe a couple times throughout their day. We have ergonomic recliners, that have stereo speakers built in. We can play pre-recorded uh, autogenic relaxation um, files to help people relax your foot, relax your leg, relax your hips. The narration's a little more detailed than that. And we use the M-Wave software made by the heart math people so that they can actually see, oh yeah, now my heart is in this nice, easy rhythm. It speeds up as I inhale, it relaxes as I exhale. And I just want to maintain that nice, soft rhythm. I'm going to do that for 10, 12, 15 minutes. And I'm going to get up and you kind of feel like you had an hour, hour and a half nap. It's a wonderful, it's a wonderful recovery snack. It does not take the place of sleep because so many important changes um, on the 
on the neurological level take place when you sleep, um, but just doing simple physical recovery throughout the day, um, even if it's only for five minutes between when you wake up in the morning and 12 noon, and then another five minutes between 12 noon and when your work day or class day is over, just taking that time out to sit still, let muscle tension go, simplify your thought process instead of thinking about the systems engineering project and the report I have to make to my tactical officer, I'm just going to think about strength and honor, strength and honor, or Hail Mary, or some phrase that has a little bit of meaning for you, and I'm just going to stay with that for maybe five minutes, and that's a recovery exercise that will just help you be more energetic when you need to be. Starting to wrap this up, uh, I'm curious, given, you know, I think you just mentioned you've been uh, there at West Point for 30 years. In the book, you detail some work that you've done with some high-level athletes. I'm curious how much resistance top performers or, or performers who want to become top performers, how much resistance they have just to the idea that this I, this confidence is workable, that it's not some people have it and some people don't that it's not physical gifts lead to confidence and confidence leads to physical performance. I'm just curious, the, the, the really high performers, do they get it? Do they, are they resistant to it? Do they fight it? Some, some are resistant to it. Some are absolutely curious about it. Mm. You know, I spent a lot, I spent a lot of years, uh, advising an NHL team, um, and there would be some veteran players, I mean, guys who had been around the league for a long time, and they were constantly looking for an edge. And they were going, hmm, you know, Dr. Z, this sounds pretty good. I might want to try that. Um, you know, some of the younger players would say, eh, okay, mm, not too interested. But occasionally you'd have a young guy who, you know, who had read a book or had had a, a, a coach maybe mention some of these things who would in, instantly snap it up. So it really it really goes the full range. Um, the um, the misconception that you mentioned, OK, uh, the success has to come first and then I'm going to be confident. Um, there are a lot of guys who are open to maybe not buying into that too much okay mm. and i because i tell them stories about people who've had a heck of a lot of success but who don't necessarily develop the confidence that you think they might have reason being they don't think enough about their success they think about the times in their career when they've fallen short where they've been frustrated and that's what they predominantly put their mind and their memory onto. As a result, they feel kind of uncertain, despite if they shifted what they paid attention to about themselves. Oh, they got all kinds of material that they could feel really good about. You know? So, you know, to get back to your question, some elite athletes are always eyes wide open, looking for that next little edge, you know, and they are they they know something, they feel it when they when they achieve it, um, and as soon as they hit on something that works, they're going to stick with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Got it, Ben. Any last questions before we wrap this up? Good to go. I really no? appreciate Good. the conversation. All right, Doc Z. Hey, fellas. Thank you very th much. This has been a joy. Uh, keep working that guy Chandler Smith real hard. We're trying. Um, I look. I look. I look forward to seeing him on, you know, the world podium, um, biggest, baddest, bestest, handsomest guy um, out there. Uh, <laughs> keep working him hard. Give him my best. And thank you for, my, uh, for the opportunity to share some of this um, with you and your listeners. Appreciate it very much, Dr. Z. Thank you. Thank keep you, doing sir. good stuff. Good luck again. Will do.
The book, again, is called The Confident Mind, A Battle-Tested Guide to Unshakable Performance. You can get it wherever you get your books. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for your ratings and your reviews. And Ben and I will be back next week for another episode of Chasing Excellence. You can get every episode of Chasing Excellence wherever you listen to your podcasts or on YouTube. Until next time, thank you for listening.